In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. I bring you greetings from Yale University in New Haven. Yes, you can tell this is a Connecticut accent, can't you? And from the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale in particular, which I'm dean, and which is the seminary that does its work within Yale to prepare uh, ordained and lay ministers for the work of the Episcopal Church and the wider Anglican Communion. And of course, if you hadn't guessed, your rector is one of our esteemed graduates. So it's wonderful to be here in uh, fellowship with you and acknowledging this shared work that we have for the gospel and for the church. Uh, this is the third Sunday in a row, and the last one, in fact, uh, when we hear stories that are directly related to the resurrection of Jesus, the actual appearances of Jesus in the Gospels. And if you were here last week, that's not an attendance check, because how am I going to know, but um, you, you may nevertheless remember that always on that second Sunday of Easter, we hear the story of Thomas, Thomas of who, who is doubting, and it almost always seems as if the resolution of that story is the old adage, seeing is believing, right? Because he doesn't sort of work with the story of having been told Jesus is risen, he wants to see and feel and so forth. But you know, the Thomas story is, is kind of exceptional in that regard, because more often when we read the stories of the risen Jesus appearing to his disciples, his appearance actually gives rise to confusion, rather than to clarity. You, you know these stories, I think, many of you. Uh, Mary is near the tomb and has a conversation with someone whom she thinks is the gardener. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, the disciples are instructed to go and meet Jesus in Galilee, and we read, and they worshipped him, but some doubted. This is right there, you know, in his presence. They've got everything you would think you would need for proof, and no, this doesn't work. And then, not last but not least, immediately prior to this story from Luke's gospel is that famous one where two disciples are walking on the road between Jerusalem and a village called Emmaus. Do you remember this one? Where Jesus is also on the road with them as their fellow traveler, and they walk with him apparently for hours. That's a first sort of curiosity. And not only that, he actually engages in a a lengthy sort of biblical studies lecture apparently with them, explaining to them the reason that the events had taken place to which they're referring, which had happened to him, and yet they don't know who he is until. You remember the punch line of that one? They, it's dark and they get to the place they're going at Emmaus and they invite him in to their table for hospitality. <clears throat> and at the meal, he takes the bread, which of course is the central foodstuff of uh, ancient Mediterranean and much modern Mediterranean food, and he breaks the bread and their eyes are open and they recognized him. And then they run back to Jerusalem to see the 12 to tell them what's going on and this is where we come into today's gospel. It's actually the aftermath to that story. All right, so Jesus shows up again in their midst and once again, as you've already sort of learned to expect from my setup, there is confusion and disbelief. So it's not exactly as if Jesus appearing is the resolution of the, the doubts that the fact of not only his death, but even his resurrection brings about. Jesus comes and stands in their midst and they are, they are frightened and they are confused. So Jesus then attempts to engage with them to sort of give them a sense of what's going on. And he, he starts with a high-minded sort of approach. The, you would expect, of course, a great religious leader coming back after such a trauma to give them something profound and deep. And so he starts at the top. Peace be with you. And it doesn't work. They are startled and terrified and they think they've seen a ghost. So then that's strike one. Then Jesus tries again. Look, uh, my hands and my feet, touch me and see, I'm not a ghost, I'm really here. And the response is, the needle shifts a little bit at this point. The response says that in their joy, they were startled and disbelieving. So at this point, you can sort of imagine Jesus getting a little bit dispirited. I mean, these, although he does actually know from previous experience that the disciples are pretty much a thick bunch. It's true. So... Here is the third and crucial attempt to get them to understand that something significant has happened and that he has genuinely risen from the dead. 
Do you have anything to eat? (laughs) This is literally what happens. And they give him some fish and he eats it. And that is what actually resolves the question. That is what shows them that Jesus has actually risen from the dead. Why is this? Well, of course, there's a, there's a simple sort of physiological element to this that we shouldn't acknowledge. That's to say the fact that he's showing he has a digestive system is presumably part of the fact that he's showing them that there is a, a material reality and not simply a, a, a spiritual, fantastic or, you know, delusional sort of thing going on here. Fair enough. But it's a lot more than that, may I suggest. Remember that we've come straight from that story where sitting with those other disciples, Bible study couldn't tell them who he was, physical proximity couldn't tell them who he was, but when he broke the bread, something happened in their consciousness that helped them to understand that this was indeed Jesus the Messiah. I think we have to hear this resurrection story in rather similar terms. Give me something to eat uh, is, for all its prosaic nature, an echo of things that they already knew about him from the ministry and the time that they had shared together. You remember this, but let me remind you. The the character of the ministry of Jesus had as much to do with the way he ate with people as with the things he said. Three quick examples. Miraculous feeding of 5,000 people with bread and fish. Remember that these two stories, the Emmaus story is breaking bread, and this next story is fish. So we've actually got an echo there of that much earlier miraculous feeding story. So point one, he's reminding them that his messianic mission included feeding the poorest people out there in the countryside, people who would, we have to imagine, I think often dispossessed peasants or landless laborers like those he speaks of in parables waiting to be hired in the, in the, in the, the marketplace. So the miraculous feedings are, are being echoed here. Um, second, he's reminding us of the ways in which he ate that actually gave rise to his own uh, celebration by the poor and his rejection by the powerful. So he was accused, you may remember this, of being a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is because unlike John the Baptist, who had a very... Uh, ascetic diet. Jesus was happy to receive invitations to banquets, and not only that, to receive them from people who were perhaps materially prosperous, unlike the ones out in the countryside with the bread and fish, materially prosperous, but socially and religiously on the nose, the tax collectors in particular. And in in Luke's gospel, from which this story comes, this is embodied in particular in the story of Zacchaeus. Do you remember him? the guy who sort of climbs up the tree in Jericho so that he can see Jesus go past. And when Jesus calls him down, the result is not that I want you to sit with me to have a three-hour seminar on prophetic literature or about biblical ethics. The result is that we're going to eat at your place now, Zacchaeus. And it's in that context of the celebratory festive meal that they join together in that Zacchaeus says, I'm going to restore everything I've taken under false pretenses, and look, I'm going to give away half of everything I have to the poor. It's particularly true in Luke's gospel that we hear this messianic identity and mission of Jesus as being one of eating and drinking and of feeding people. Uh, In Luke's gospel, there are more of these stories, and uh, one leading scholar on Luke's gospel describes the conflict that Jesus enters into with the Roman and the Jewish authorities that leads to his death in these terms. Jesus was killed because of the way he ate. So, you see, it isn't really so surprising that a Jesus whose messianic identity really has to do with feeding the poor and eating with unlikely people and otherwise showing his disciples that Food itself is both a symbol of the kingdom but also something which is fundamental to human needs. Why would it be so surprising that he shows up in the resurrection and says, give me something to eat? There's, of course, one more meal that we shouldn't forget to reference here that is being hinted at when he shows up in the resurrection. It's the one that had taken place just a few days before when he gathered with them at his last supper, as we call it, the celebration of the Jewish Passover, and once again had taken bread 
and broken it, the same sort of language that's used in this, and had given it to them and said, this is my body, and invites them to share in it somehow. This extraordinary symbolism, we're so used to it because we're going to hear that same story recited again in the context of our Eucharistic prayer. But he invited them, in a sense, to internalise that body that he is offering them broken. And then sharing the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So the Jesus who shows up in the resurrection and struggles to get any traction with them by the high-minded religious discourse or even by the proof of his hands and his feet is unsurprisingly going to resort to saying, you remember who I am. I'm the one that used to eat that way. And now my resurrection constitutes the proof of God's vindication of that mission, which the world has rejected, but into which you continue to be called now. So when he shares that broken bread with the Emmaus disciples, when he takes that broiled fish from these disciples who have welcomed him here, we are, of course, being encouraged to think, because I'm sure Luke is presenting it to, this, to us this way, that our own ongoing acts of breaking bread together, as we will do today, constitute not simply a nostalgic memory about Jesus who did this once, performed this peculiar symbolic ritual, but rather a reminder that when the bread is broken and when we share it together, that we too encounter him just as those disciples did on the road to Emmaus. And then what? The consequences, I suspect, we have to learn from thinking again about the character of Jesus' ministry. We too are called to literally serve and feed the poor. I think that a Eucharistic community that doesn't actually have a way of thinking about how the local community's needs and those who are hungry and those who live in food deserts and a world in which so much of the food that's produced is wasted, that unless we actually have an effective witness that involves that sense of the deepest human need embodied in hunger, then we are failing to live and to embody the ministry of Jesus himself. But of course, we also know there are other forms of hunger and need. Each of us comes as a person whose own deepest self has acknowledged our dependence upon God, and we seek to be fed in the different ways that we find here, both in the Eucharist itself, but in our community and in the life of prayer. Jesus calls us all to be witnesses who are going to continue to embody that mission which the world rejected and killed, but which God has raised from the dead. We are the living witnesses today of that reality of the Christ who says not simply that God has the capacity to revivify a dead body, but rather who says that God has the will to continue in our lives the mission that Jesus had of showing the gracious will and love of God. And so that gospel story today finishes with Jesus' instruction to them that now you're going to proclaim the good news of salvation beginning in Jerusalem and going to the end of the earth. But here we come to worship, we come to receive the broken bread, and we understand that we ourselves come both with hope and with expectation, but also with need. We come to Jesus, as it were, and we say to him again and again, Lord, do you have anything to eat? And he says to us, yes. Amen.